13 minutes past 8 Central African time. You are listening to Sabah and Muslim Radio Islam International. Well-known political analyst Imzom Polasi has written an article in which he suggests that BDS South Africa's anti-Woolworths campaign has the markings of a misdirected campaign. Uh, he says that, uh, you know, he poses the question about what the campaign has achieved beyond persuading around 800 people to turn up at its Farrell Williams uh, protest. Now, this is not the first time that the BDS campaign's effectiveness has been questioned. A boycott, divestment, and sanction South Africa, the local chapter of a global movement pushing for boycotts against the State of Israel, has been conducting a very public boycott campaign against Woolworths with the aim of pressurizing the company into no longer stocking Israeli sourced products. It also went all out to call for protests against U.S. singer Farrell Williams when he performed in South Africa recently as a guest of Woolworths. Now, to have a dis- uh, discussion and a debate on the issue, we are joined this morning on the line by a political analyst Umzo Umpalasi and the BDS's Mohammed Desai. Uh, Umzo, thank you so much for your time. We understand that you are overseas and, and we appreciate uh, you taking our time for this discussion. Good morning and welcome. Good morning and thank you for having me. Mohammed, Jazakumullah for your time. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. So let's start with you. Broadly speaking, you, you feel that uh, this is a misdirected campaign. They have not harmed Woolworths financially. They haven't managed to cause reputational or brand damage. And that uh, they are making uses of themselves when they protest. In, in a nutshell, is that what you say? Effectively, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. And uh, to my mind, it's, it's a legitimate campaign. Um, but one that whose tactics are questionable and really not defined by the end goal and certainly misdirected in the sense that uh, what is the value of targeting Woolworths if uh, there has to be no uh, profit-driven impact and nor has there been any brand-driven impact and certainly no concessions whatsoever in terms of uh, sourcing goods from Israel. So to my mind, I say it's misdirected in that not to say the campaign is not legitimate, uh, Palestinians should uh, be afforded rights and statehood like every other uh, nation group in the world. However, uh, this, to my mind, has to be closely aligned with what the Palestinian interests are and actually have an end goal in mind. One that does not, uh, I would say, be at the periphery of uh, solving the Palestinian issue and actually is involved and involved in this sense will be to drive the South African government position and certainly all the other regional entities that have a vested interest in Palestinian statehood. Okay, moment. Let, let's take it issue by issue. Uh, firstly, you know, starting with what was most recent, uh, Imzo mentions this in his article that uh, BDS had claimed that it would bring together with its coalition partners uh, about 15 to 16 thousand people uh, to the uh, Farrell Williams protest in, in Cape Town, and all that you managed to, to get was uh, between 800 and, and 3 thousand, depending on, on, the, on the varying figures. Uh, is that indicative of the fact that BDS is not as uh, powerful, does not have as, uh, as much an impact as you would like to, uh, people to be? Well, firstly, thanks to Mazov for his analysis, for the time that he took to write his recent op-ed, as well as for his critique. Uh, criticism, when done constructively, is very useful, and it allows us to improve and make certain tweaks that ultimately allow us to run more effective and successful campaigns. Mm-hmm. The biggest success of the Boycott Woolworths campaign so far has been the ability of taking this issue of BDS, which is sometimes an abstract issue, which is usually about lobbying governments, which is about pushing political parties, which is about engaging with churches and investment funds, is about taking this BDS issue and bringing it, bringing it down to supper tables, lunchroom conversations, prize and other uh, occasions. It's allowed ordinary people to be part of this extraordinary uh, movement. As for, the, uh, as for the protest that has recently took place outside Farrell, Williams uh, concert. Now, um, the CEO of Fullwoods claims that, it, that there were 350 people. The South African Zionist Federation, like Mzor, claims that there were 800 uh, people. The Times Media Group claimed that there were 1,500. The Independent Media Group claimed that there were 2,000. But the police indicated that there were 2,500 people on the day 
at the picket that took place outside the Farrell Williams concert. Now, according to their own numbers by, let's take the CEO of Woolworth, Olmzo, the court battles that took place and that were won just two days before that tried to initially limit the protest to 150 people were extremely important and successful because we had more than double or triple the amount of people at that protest uh, um, compared to what the, the concert organizers wanted us to be limited to. The Fidel Williams protest was discussed more. The Boycott Woolworths campaign was discussed more. The Israeli links to Woolworths were discussed more than the fact that a U.S. artist was in this country. According to a Cape Town-based uh, media analysis group, over 75% of all media items in the two-week period, including the week that Fidel Williams was in this country, more media spoke about the Fidel Williams, about the Boycott Woolworths campaign and the Israeli BDS movement compared to the fact of Woolworth bringing out this artist. So we think that the protest was extremely successful. It was also a celebration of the one year that the Boycott Woolworth campaign right. has been in existence. Now, I take your point, Mohammed, that uh, it generated a lot of media coverage around BDS and around the, the, the protest and the picket against the concert. But uh, BDS was talking about figures around 15 and 16,000. The fact that if we go with 2,500 people only showing up, uh, is that of no concern to you? Well, the fact that we won the court battle just two days before the protest took place, it was an achievement to get 2,500 uh, people out to the protest. But secondly, the court allowed 15,000 uh, people, and we were confident that we would have galvanized that support if, we were, if the stumbling blocks weren't put in place by the concert organizers, by Grand West Casino, and by the city of uh, Cape Town. Okay. Now, now, uh, Imzo, you mentioned in your article that this t this protest turned out to be the dampest of squids. So do, do, do you buy Mohammed's uh, explanation? Well, this is the thing. Um, if if we look at numbers, it will depend from what vantage point was the person looking at uh, as to how they went about sort of their data collection, if you like. Hmm. Uh, and that is exactly the problem, to my mind, is that if the true test of the campaign is how many numbers the campaign galvanizes, then I say it's misdirected in that regard because then it becomes a case of your success is determined by the number of people we're able to bring and not so much the movement in what you are hoping to achieve, a hope as, a, uh, as an end game. And effectively, you, you become so misdirected from what actually is at stake in the sense that I would argue as a person who travels to the region quite regularly that uh, a Woolworths campaign to an ordinary Palestinian who's looking for civil and political rights is somewhat misdirected. They would argue that something that is actually more concrete aligned with their interests and with their cooperation would make a lot of sense. And certainly, I know uh, Mr. Desai mentioned that uh, traditionally it's been about lobbying governments but the truth of the matter is is that any solidarity campaign or any sort of uh, 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 a campaign that seeks to draw awareness or attention really the movers on this would be the South African government so that is where all of these efforts should culminate into not so much about artists and all of this stuff and words who tell me that they only source about 0.1% of their goods and then being in the question, surely there has to be something more concrete than that rather than these retail and all of these things, whereas BDS itself will never be the first mover or important mover for the change of behavior that you'd want to see in the Middle East, it will ultimately be government, it will ultimately be negotiations. And that discussion is so far removed when we consider, uh, I'll say, the, the general spirit and the general uh, focus of the campaign, if we're simply talking about <laughs> artists and, and all of this stuff, it is actually far removed from the issue at stake. What well, your response to that, that you, you, you're barking up the wrong tree, if I uh, understand Umzo's point correctly. You're supposed to be lobbying government. You're supposed to be taking up issues that will make a difference to those people on the streets of Palestine. Uh, there's little, little relevance between what, what uh, they need and, 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 and stopping Woolworths from stocking a few products. Well, in some ways, Umzo is absolutely correct, but in other ways, wrong. Um, the anti-apartheid movement of the 1980s against apartheid South Africa showed us how 
on the one hand, you had Oliver Tambo, Archbishop Tutu, and others that traveled to the governments of the world, demanding over year and year and year that sanctions be imposed on the apartheid government, whilst at the same time, simultaneously, there were successful protests against rugby matches, against soccer games, against artists, and against supermarkets that traded with apartheid South Africa. It's not about one or the other. The two have to take place simultaneously. So there must be a lobbying of the ANC as it goes up to its NGC. There must be pressure put on the South African government. But there is also a need to galvanize public support. And the Boycott Woolworth campaign allows us that opportunity to galvanize communities to be part of this BDS movement. So in some ways, yes, Mzo is correct. Governments need to impose stronger sanctions against the apartheid government of Israel. But he is wrong in that this is the only form of pressure. We need pressure from various different avenues. And the Boycott Woolworth campaign, incidentally, was brought and called for after consultation with the Palestinians who urged a boycott of a South African retailer that is indeed engaging in, uh, in trade with Israeli agricultural companies because the virtual majority of Israeli agricultural companies have illegal Israeli activities. Now, so let me, let me put the question to you in this way. Uh, would you agree with Mohammed that uh, a, a boycott campaign or a boycott-based strategy was effective uh, in, in bringing the apartheid regime to its knees? And if you agree on that point, how, how do you think BDA should be doing their work differently in order to be more effective, in, to, in order to play a kind of uh, role that we saw those who, who call for boycotts against the apartheid regime effectively play? Well, first of all, um, the campaign needs to actually be watered down to what South Africans would recognize. In that, uh, boycotting Woolworths, I, I don't even shop at Woolworths, for instance, you know, not because it's a boycott or anything of the sort, it's just that my financial budget does not allow me to shop at Woolworths. And I speak for many other South Africans who would struggle to do that. So therefore, the campaign of, of who shops there, who shops here, and all of this stuff is actually far removed from my context. Ultimately, South Africans, by their making and their history, you know, they are closely aligned to seeking civil and political freedoms. That is something that is in our making. And certainly, everyone would recognize that. But the manner in which, which it's done, uh, it's almost as if, to me, it's, 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 it's somewhat randomized something, for instance. You, uh, Mr. Desai talks about sort of the agricultural links and all of this stuff. For a company sourcing 0.1% of its goods, to my mind, I would imagine that within the 9 billion uh, rand worth of trade that happens between Israel and South Africa, which most of it, by the way, is exports from South Africa to Israel, you would certainly find a much more, uh, I would say, actor of good standing in that with significantly, significantly more trade. So, uh, you know, the, I've seen arguments where people say, are there vested interests to the campaign where you could take an actor that necessarily does not do that much trade in the grander scheme of trade that we do with Israel? So from that standpoint as well. Okay. And also, it could also be around the spirit, the spirit of the campaign. You know, uh, all those people who are lobbying around uh, getting apartheid South Africa ostracized, effectively becoming a pariah state. They did that not against uh, the white people, mainly the white people that supported this beyond the borders of South Africa and all other countries that supported this. They effectively made the cause relevant to everyone concerned without antagonizing everyone. And another point that I'm making that keeps, you know, I'll put a question mark to it because there has been this uh, talk every time you see a BDS campaign, there's always this uh, anti-Semitic Jewish, uh, anti-Jewish sort of link associated with it. And unless that is addressed, maybe the overall appeal of the campaign, of how it's made relevant for all South Africans, given the history that I've articulated, given the sort of pro-Palestinian predisposition of most South Africans, and certainly given the context that you need to get a broader form of society to support mm. the courts, that needs to happen. And one feels that is not in sync with the current campaign that Mr. Desai and his colleagues 
uh, 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 embarking on. Okay, let's let's take a look at some of the specifics. Mohammed, uh, in his article, Umzo argues that uh, BDS's campaign. Uh, which is, as you mentioned, one year old now, has not hurt uh, Woolworths financially. Actually, to the contrary, uh, Woolworths profits are higher now than they were a year ago. And he claims that uh, that so-called analyst that uh, came out from Wits, uh, Clara Gattenby, claiming that Woolworths was losing about 8 million rands a year, has turned out to be a, a, a sociology student who's actually a BDS activist. So there's no credible uh, uh, authority that has come out to back up BDS's claims that they've been able to uh, hurt Woolworths financially as a result of the boycott campaign. Your, your response, Mohammed? Well, first I want to absolutely dismiss um, Zor's argument that the BDS movement and the boycott Woolworths campaign is anti-Semitic. The fact that you have, for example, uh, South African Jews for the Free Palestine, the fact that you have the anti-apartheid Jewish icon, Dennis Goldberg, uh, all participating in the boycott Woolworths campaign gives you an indication that even Jews are part of our movement and to suggest that this is an anti-Jewish uh, movement or an anti-Jewish campaign is absolutely false and is an argument usually reserved for pro-Israeli uh, supporters. We've managed to capture the spirit of the 1980s where we have artists, comedians, sports people, government ministers, trade unions, workers at Woolworths as well, all joining this boycott Woolworths campaign and by its association the larger uh, BDS movement. Le uh, bringing, uh, c coming to the report that was produced last year, about 8 million rands a month that the company is losing. Even, let's, let's put aside Kira Gattenby for a second. The factual evidence captured inside that report, the over 4,000 people that participated in the survey, the internet searches that were conducted cannot be disputed. The evidence speaks for itself. Even before any analysis is applied to that factual information, the information speaks about the growth of the campaign and the successes at a financial level, but also at a PR level. The CEO, Ian Moyer, of the company Woolworth, said to the Business Times that the largest challenge facing the company's PRs today is the boycott and has been the boycott of Woolworth's campaign. So according to its own records, according to the company, itself. The boycott Woolworths campaign is having a PR impact, but we also claim a financial impact. Yes, we don't deny for a second that Woolworths has grown in terms of its finances. However, its growth is lower than expected and lower than anticipated. How does Mzo, for example, explain the fact that three Woolworths stores have not met their turnover targets and that the manager, at least of one of these stores, has come out to BDS South Africa, making it clear that the reason he has not met his turnover target between 2014 and 2015 is a direct result of the boycott Woolworths campaign and the non-violent BDS protests and tickets that have been taking place. Okay. Um, so, you know, just, just a few specific questions. Firstly, do, do you believe that uh, Israel is an apartheid state? And, and, and what's your evidence to say that there's, there's this anti-Semitism that comes across from BDS activities? Well, um, first of all, I don't uh, don't believe that Israel is an apartheid state, um, and certainly I'm not the only one who would hold that view. And I don't think that the ANC government that we have uh, could be so misguided uh, to have relations with an apartheid state. So just from that point of view, I wouldn't argue that Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, and then, in so far as uh, you know, the anti-Semitic stuff, um, in that. You know, I've, I've gone to some of these protests, and I've been there, you know, everyone is pro-Palestinian in South Africa, as I said. Uh, but then you quickly realize that uh, some people, you know, for me, I partake uh, in a cause that is pro-anything, so long as we see what the end game is. And particularly with regards to uh, the Palestinian cause, the end game is the true state, is what we all would agree and certainly want to see that actions that we partake in drive the South African government to agitate that, for that, uh, whether it be by envoys or here, uh, Pahad, or basically expanding uh, the nature of the negotiations to, clue, to include other actors, uh, not just the United States, to include South Africa, to include uh, developing nations of the world who want to see a Palestinian state. So. That is the end game. But then when you realize that 
uh, you know, I had a conversation with one lady uh, at one of the protests who simply told me that, you know, uh, the end game is that Israel should not exist. And I was like, well, that's not in sync with what I'm thinking. So certainly, if you have of that following, um, and indeed, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't represent, I would say, the mainstream of BDS, yeah, certainly not. But if you have those vested interests, the same interests, for instance, where you found, uh, you remember the, 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 the whole pig incident, which was sort of uh, um, an insult both to Muslims and uh, to Jewish South Africans to have uh, basically things that are haram in a store that is meant to, uh, to, 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 to represent all South Africans. And, that, to my mind, comes from a, that misinterpretation of actually what's happening, what the campaign is about. Right. That, for instance, drove that aims to use league person or Costas or whomever is part of the protest to translate, effectively, the campaign to meet mm. this. And also, we, we've had other instances, you know, uh, you know, for instance, you know, people will call me and ask, you know, what do I think of this and this and this and all of it will have to do about incidents, you know, have to do around uh, sort of uh, picketing or uh, boycotting a certain event or something to that effect, which to my mind sometimes is peppered with that. And right. I say, you know, maybe part of the same movement and sometimes not everyone is aligned about what the movement is actually doing. Okay, now, so what's your response to what Mohammed had said about uh, what you mentioned in your article, that they're having no financial impact and they're having no impact on Woolworth's, uh, uh, Woolworth's uh, PR and brand. He's given those examples about uh, the, the survey, uh, the growth, the, the, the East profits, the East growth, but it's less than expected. Three stores are not meeting the targets and Woolworth's own CEO he always on record as saying that the biggest PR headache at the moment is BDS. Your, your response to that? Well, for me, um, you know, uh, all of that other stuff is speculation. The numbers are what people are concerned about. So, for instance, if you go to Woolworths and your shareholder, you will be told that numbers don't lie. They've shown a growth of both your sort of uh, market capitalization, your share price, and also the profit that they've derived from their acquisitions of their Australian entities or something to that effect. Uh, they've actually bolstered their profits. Their profits have, uh, have actually risen. And secondly, when it comes to the monitoring, you know, the market share monitoring, whether it be it from AC Nielsen, whether it be it uh, from um, the brand tracking uh, companies, they indicate that Woolworths uh, sort of remains uh, uh, sort of perceived to be a high-end retailer. And indeed, the campaign is there as a nuisance but not so much as a mover of basically resulting in declining profits uh, uh, and, of course, resulting in, I would say, less brand appeal. They would be happy at Woolworths for a very long time compared to other retailers. They're pretty much up there. They continue to be a trendsetter in some of their goods and products and all of this stuff, so remaining largely unaffected okay. about this. Indeed, when it comes to the company, whenever you have a boycott against your company, that is a great challenge because you know that that will always be there. It's a risk that you will have to map in, for instance, in your company strategy, integrated reports or whatever else. It's something that remains there and certainly one that you have to defend throughout the financial year. Now, Mohamed, your response to uh, to Tumzo's claims about inappropriate behavior at the protest and the few examples that is given now and also in his article. Well, uh, you know, the, the example is given that a supporter was approached and the supporter wants to see the demise of the Israeli regime. Uh, even during the anti-apartheid movement, you had people that tried to paint the anti-apartheid movement as one that was against white people. And the ANC in the larger liberation struggle had to always defend itself and has to always put forward its policies and its positions. And so I urge Mzoi and all others to visit the websites of BDS South Africa, the larger, uh, larger BDS movement, to find out what on record is our position regarding our end goal. Our end goal is the end of the occupation, full equality for Palestinian citizens of uh, Israel, and thirdly, for the right of return of Palestinian refugees to be respected by the state of uh, Israel. One should go to the spokesperson and not to some person on the street to find out what is the position of the larger BDS uh, movement. I'll also urge uh, to look into our history and into our archives. Yes, 
India terminated its relations with apartheid South Africa right at the start. However, even the most friendliest of countries, various Nordic and various European countries, still maintained relations with the apartheid government, still had embassies while certain forms of sanctions were being applied and whilst those governments were actually supporting the liberation struggle. Just because South Africa, because of uh, the apartheid relations with uh, Israel, just because South Africa has an embassy in Tel Aviv doesn't mean that it shouldn't be imposing sanctions, just as how various Nordic and European countries, as well as various other countries, including the USA, had embassies in apartheid South Africa, but yet at the same time imposed, uh, imposed uh, sanctions. Mm. Boycotting Israel is not contrary to having uh, diplomatic uh, relations. Um, so you've heard Mohammed's uh, arguments and, and his responses to some of your arguments. Uh, is, is there anything that uh, you, you would change, anything that you would uh, consider differently based on what you've said? And at the same time, if you can give us uh, your concluding remarks. Well, I mean, I've still maintained what I said in the article, and uh, Mr. Desai has not pointed out where of course, where I'm factually wrong or something to that effect. But at the end of the day, uh, what I'm saying with the article, it, the campaign being misdirected, is that ultimately, uh, when it all comes to it, it will actually be state decisions that drive this process. Uh, indeed, the solidarity campaign, the boycott campaigns, and all of that stuff can continue ad nauseum. That's what some organizations are there for, solidarity campaigns. But the point is to drive the South African government to drive the process on the ground and for the campaign to be fully linked with the needs. Uh, yes, I like the fact that you mentioned the civil and political rights being extended to, uh, to Palestinians. That is, is the thing, that the, com uh, the, the, the campaign needs to be linked with the actual plight of Palestinians. And indeed, I return to this issue. To my mind, it's not just because um, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not pro-sanction simply because the South African government maintains relations. It's out of the understanding that if you take, I would say, in this case, measures that are towards the extreme angle, which is to issue sanctions, you effectively draw yourself out of the process and effectively would have not only presence in Tel Aviv, in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank as we currently have, as the South African government will effectively withdraw from that process and be reduced to campaign, something that would weaken the South African position and certainly the position of Palestinians, knowing fully well that South Africans are pro-Palestinian, as I said from the outset. So that needs to change. The campaign of who's selling this, who's selling this, it, it's important. It's, it's a solidarity campaign. But at the end of the day, what the campaign is doing must be linked with actual social change that the, com that the campaign wants to drive. Mohammed, your concluding remarks? Well, it's disappointing that Mr. Colum Polase doesn't agree with Dennis Goldberg, Ronnie Castle, Ben Churok, Balek Mbete, Archbishop Tutu, John Dugard, Winnie Mandela, and the various others that do consider Israel an apartheid state. It's also disappointing that he doesn't learn from our history that sanctions played a successful role in bringing an end to apartheid locally and that it can have a role in the Israeli-Palestinian issue. However, the biggest proof of the effectiveness of the boycott Woolworth campaign is perhaps having a discussion with somebody as uh, with the stature of Mr. Tolo Mpolase one year later after the campaign was launched. The campaign is having a financial impact, it's having a PR impact, but one of the largest benefits is that it's bringing the BDS movement, sometimes something that is out there and abstract, into the homes of every ordinary person, allowing all households to be part of an extraordinary movement. Mzom Polasi, thank you so much for your time this morning. Much appreciated and uh, have a great trip and, and a safe return home. Thank you for having me. And uh, Mohammed Jazakumullah for your time as always. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.